All right. Hey, everybody. What's going on? Ryan here with Off Grid Back Country Adventures. I got Bob from Cheap RV Living, and we're here to talk to you about off grid living and also nomadic lifestyles. And for my audience, we are both simultaneous live broadcasting. Those of you on CRVL, Cheap RV Living, glad you are here. As you know, I've bought recently bought a, uh, I've had a land for a while, but I haven't done anything with it. I bought a piece of land. I plan to do things with it. So we are going to be talking about, Brian is really way ahead of me here. I've been, he's showed me his property and it's astounding. Uh, you are way progressed into having a real ongoing homestead. Well, you know, this, this just this year, uh, I really made a lot of progress because yes. the, the, the first year and a half out here, it really was just cutting into infrastructure because I did everything by hand. And the reason why I did that is I wanted to keep the cool, kind of natural look of the land. And then also on my property here on the upper section, like we were talking about earlier today, I can operate here during monsoon season because the mud doesn't come here. It's all been drained over the, over the eons with me being up on this ridge. So it's kind of like naturally gravel. So I thought if I don't disturb the soil and I go in and build these trails in and use the natural contours of the land, then I'll be able to operate during monsoon season. And as a result, you know, it just takes a lot longer to do it, but I think it looks great. And so once I got that infrastructure built this year and then got this cabin or the, the camper uh, covered all squared away, I really started to jam on like getting my food production up, building more spaces for like a chicken coop that I want to get going. I also want to put space for uh, build, build space for uh, uh, meat birds, you know, chickens that you can slaughter for meat. And really make it to where I don't really need to leave that much to go to like, you know, get groceries and those things. Maybe every, maybe once a month. That's my goal is to make it to where I just go leave once a month. And the rest of the time I'm here living off my land, growing food and, you know, just living the good life out here. It's awesome. I mean, I, I love living in this area. I never thought I'd be in northern Arizona. Um, I always thought I'd be either in Colorado or Wyoming or Montana or something like that. But I came out here and the more time I spend out here, the less I ever want to. I just don't want to leave. I want to go. I want to stay here, focus on this area and just really get this built up to where it's kind of like my buffer from from the world. You know, and, and I like that. I like having that space. So right. um, let me uh, I'll just sort of jump in here. OK. Now I know a lot of you are are interested in buying land and some of you may be thinking, well, isn't aren't they exact opposites is is. Buying land and being a nomad, are they contradictory? Are they bad, different ideas? Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, that's not the case. Uh, you can have a, a piece of land as a home base, and then you can take travels and trips out of it. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to be on my land all year. I don't think ever. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when I get old enough, and that's a big consideration, we're not gonna, always going to be young and healthy. Right. And when you get old enough, you're going to want to have a, a base and when you're not being able to drive her a lot, that's where you're going to call home. Mm -hmm. So I think the two go together really well. And I hope we can give you some really good tipper tip tippers <laughs> <laughs> tips on how to buy land, where to buy land. I know that's what most of you are interested in. We got a bunch of questions in, uh -huh. so we'll try to answer your questions, but I think the two go together. Uh, Brian, you were on, uh, on wheels for seven years. Yep. And, and I got off when Sierra got cancer and I was also real sick myself. I had a parasite. Right got down to 119 pounds. It was really hard. And so having this land, you know, that my goal going forward is like what you said, you know, have it here, but then do trips, you know, right. go out for two or three months at a time. But there's something about having land that gives me peace of mind, especially with what's happened in the past couple of years. Cause when, you know, when things started to get crazy in 2020, it was different. The, the vibe on the road changed. I don't know if you felt it, but I did. It seemed like it was just a little different. And so that was another reason why I started looking for land as well. But I wanted it to be out far enough to where I didn't feel like I was going back to the city because I don't want to do that. I want to live out in the country for the rest of my life. And this is great because I can use this as a home base, but then I've got plenty of areas around here to explore. Right. So it's nice to have the two because, you know, I, I will say, too, is that some people talk about truck camping. And, oh, how come you quit truck camping? It seems like a great life. And it is a great life but you're not high-fiving Bambi every day. You know, there's, there's, there are real challenges to go along with it. And if you think about camping, a lot of people will go and camp for the weekend, but then they want to go back home after that and recharge for the week because they kind of get worn out camping. So imagine doing that straight for seven years. You get tired, you know, and I got to the point to where I really ran myself down. So having a place like this to recharge and regain my health and grow my own food and just do all those things has been really, really nice. So we did get some great questions uh, initially, and we've got a few from Bob's uh, audience here that we want to go ahead and tackle. So the first one that we've got is from Scott Christie, 
And the question is, I was wondering where I can buy a small piece of land and just put a trailer on it without restrictions as far as having to put in septic, water, electricity, et cetera. Thanks a lot. And this is a great question because this is one of the biggest things that you want to look for, in my opinion, you know, when you're looking for off-grid property. Codes can be hard to read because a lot of it is the jargon that they use for internal stuff and you might not know what they mean. So, you know, if you get in touch with a realtor, that seems like they're knowledgeable, they can explain it to you. Um, another thing too is that a lot of people think out here that the septic that you put in has to be like a legit septic system, which is anywhere from five to $25,000. It's a big expense. And the county wants you to have some sort of septic in place and every county does in Arizona, wants you to have some sort of septic in place before you start building anything because the disease is spread by human waste. And so that makes sense so they wanna contain that. However, a lot of people don't realize in Arizona, you can do a 55 gallon barrel drum septic that's approved by the, in, in any county in the state, you can get your permit to start building and then you're good to go. That costs you the materials for a 55 gallon drum, a little bit of net screening, a, a, a fly trap, and then a toilet seat that can close completely. That's it. The expense with that is nothing. And so, you know, if you're looking to like piecemeal it together and if you're on a budget, you don't have to outlay that big expense right after you get your property in order to start building something. Once you have septic in place, you can stay on your property full time, 100%. Right now I have my property listed as a recreation property. It means I come and go, but I be putting in that 55 gallon barrel septic so that way I can be here full time and it will be up to code. Uh, once you get that 55 gallon barrel septic in, you call the county, they come out, inspect it, they give you your permit, you're good to go, you can start building whatever you want. So that's a way around it. As far as electricity goes, I do all my electricity through solar. Yeah, that's yeah. Obvious. And then, you know, and the, I do have a generator for monsoon season in case if there's like five or six days of rain, because that can happen. And then you're out of solar and you don't want your groceries that, you know, you, you power your fridge off your batteries, obviously. You don't want your groceries going bad just because you don't have you know, access to any sort of power. So I use that for spot, you know, like to fill the gaps. But I'd say 95% of the time out here, I'm operating off of solar. Um, as far as water goes, I'm lucky in this area to have that community well. And it, 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 for those who have followed my channel and see where I go to get my, my water, this, this, this community that I'm in here, my, my property association dues, which only takes care of our road maintenance because we take care of our own roads, and also the well is only $92 for the entire year. And I'm allotted 4,000 gallons a month in water. I don't use near that. I use about 200 gallons. But I go over to the well. It's the same code for all of us. We have to have a lock on it because people will come up and try to get water. But our water over there is so deep. Our well is almost 1,000 feet deep. It's 100% pure. We don't need to use a purifier. It has a generator on it and everything. I just pull up, take my water tote. I have an IBC 275-gallon water tote. I back it up for the thing put in my water hose, top it, put, punch in my code and press the green button. And within one minute, I've got 300 gallons of water. And then I come back here. It's only a five minute drive from my place. So there's not a lot of wear and tear on my truck, nor am I spending a lot of gas in order to go retrieve that water and bring it back. One thing that was unsettling recently is a lot of the counties started to track the public wells. So in order to uh, get water on, um, you know, from a public well, you have to, you have to, get an account with the county, give them all your bank information, all that stuff, and they track how much water you use. And I don't know, I, for me, I just don't want to have that level of um, surveillance, I guess, if you want to call it that. So uh, that's why I like it out here with the community wells. Lots of communities have them, but make sure when you're looking for property, ask for that. And if they don't have it, I'd recommend looking somewhere else. So if I were to drill my own well out here, it cost me about $65,000. So you don't want to get into a situation, if you know if you're trying to do it on the cheap, so where that's the only way you can get water because it's a huge expense and you might hit a dry hole. You know, there's a chance that you might not hit water and then you're out of luck. So those expenses can be pretty, pretty a lot. So that's ways to keep things down, you know, operate off solar, have a community well, get the septic in that's a 55 gallon instead of putting in a real, you know, expensive one and you can get started, you know, that's the biggest thing. I think that the, the hardest part is getting going. Once you get going and you got that momentum and you got your systems in place, you're good to go. But up until that point, you're just constantly working to get to where you can start. You know what I mean? Right. So that's what I'd recommend. Also, too, like you don't want to be super far off of pavement because, uh, you know, the, with the with the monsoon season out here, it gets so muddy. And if you're pulling, you know, twenty four hundred pounds of water back to your place and it's all muddy and you got to go over hills. There's times where I can't get over the hills that come into my place. They're not that big. So if you've got like miles and miles and miles of driving off pavement, you probably don't want to do that if you're if you're wanting to have ease of you know gaining getting water, getting food, 
access to just getting out whatsoever because I, I will get trapped in here for days in the winter time there's been like three or four days where you can't get out and then find the roads are good enough and same with monsoon season so you have to kind of prepare for that you know so when looking for land when i was looking for it i'm fortunate that the first eight miles off the freeway is all paved and only have a mile and a half on county roads that we maintain that are dirt to get to my place so that's not very hard to do you know which i like so yeah Let's see, do you have anything that you, you have something to add? But yeah, I'll add something. Okay. Across Arizona, we're kind of that's where we both are. We have land in Arizona, mm -hmm. so that's what we know the most about. Across Arizona, probably the vast majority of people are just hauling in water, putting in a drill, drilling a well. As Brian said, is just prohibitively expensive and uh, uh, crapshoot. You don't know if you're going to get anything. So I think in the, the vast majority of counties in Arizona, you're hauling water in, which is yeah. essentially what you're doing. Yep. And I don't think it's going to be very likely that you'll find a homeowners association that has its own uh, its own well. Get it if you can, mm -hmm. at all possible, get that. But I wouldn't make that a requirement because in the majority of Arizona, you're not going to find that. Get it if you can. Uh, and uh, so Brian mentioned IBP totes. Is that right? IBC. IBC totes. Uh, they're the, the big square totes. They're sitting on a pallet. And they've got a frame, metal frame around them. And those are cheap. You can buy. How much do we pay for ours? About two fifty. We paid for ours just this month ago or so. Mm -hmm. So you can buy them at Home Depot. You can buy them at Tractor Supply. Almost anywhere. And then you go and haul, get your water. What you what we do is we have an IBV tote that we leave on the property, and then we go and get uh, fill our other one that stays and lives in the trailer, brings it home, transfer it. And then the trailer is not carrying that dead weight all the time. Mm -hmm. So we've got the uh, a 275 gallon tote here, and then we're going and getting it and coming back. You can also use 55 gallon drums. All right, we have two 55 gallon drums, so we get 110 gallons of water. You're gonna have to have a pump, and then you transfer it. So hauling in your own water is going to be the norm across Arizona. Mm -hmm. And finding you've got seasonal creeks here, which yes. is fantastic, mm -hmm. but finding a year round creek would just be ideal. Oh rare I, I keep looking for that yeah. on like on different websites to see if there's anything available and very rarely will you come across very something rare. and it's usually only available for about a day and then it's sold yes because <laughs> it's so highly sought out yes and that's why you might be looking at other states uh oregon water's common in oregon you might think about mm -hmm. oregon mm -hmm. there's a lot of temperate areas in oregon's where it's not terribly hot like the lowland it doesn't rain all winter like like most of the north the coast of Oregon, Washington state, same thing. Um, so California is not the only state. It's got a lot of cheap land that we know about. And so that's why, that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. That's why I think Brian's here. Well, and you know, another th the thing that I love about here is the solitude. Cause I, I spent most of my years nomading in Colorado. And then I started to branch out after about five years, I started going to Northern New Mexico, which I absolutely love. And also Southern New Mexico has some fantastic spots as well. And then came over here into Arizona, Love Sedona in the springtime, and that got me kind of attached to this area where I started to run around. And I also have friends that live down the road here. That's how I got to know the area where I'm in specifically where I purchased. And so, um, you know, in Colorado, I, I love Colorado. I'll, I, I don't mean to, I'm not saying anything bad about it, but it's just got a lot more people lately. You know, I, I moved there in 1998 when there wasn't anybody there. And so for those of you that live in Denver, you know how busy it is. Denver from the tech center, there's like two downtowns. There's the Denver tech center and the downtown. That's about a 15 mile drive. It used to take me about 20 minutes during rush hour back in 1998. Now it takes about two hours, you know? And so that has spilled over, unfortunately, into the mountain communities and the mountain communities have become a lot more just densely populated. And you have to think too, like, you know, you think Chafee County, big county. Well, yeah, but only 15% is private. The rest of it's public land. So there's not that much land. You know, it seems like it when you're driving through, but a lot of it's nationally, national forests or BLM, you can't go build there. And so the costs really went up in Colorado. It made it to a point to where I couldn't afford what I wanted. I could afford stuff there, but it was all the leftover pieces that didn't have any resources, no trees or anything like that. And the water restrictions in Colorado are, are, are quite, uh, yeah, and, and, it, and there's real big penalties and the water rights are a big deal and you can't harvest rainwater like you can out here. There's only a certain number of counties that will allow you 110 gallons of rainwater per year to harvest. And out here, you're unlimited with that. And so that's another option too for water is if you want to build rain catchment, sure. you, you know, you can, you can do that as well. So you got a couple of different options. You got the community wells 
if, if you got that. If not, you got public wells that you can go haul water from. And then as a bat, as, as the ultimate backup, you've got you've got rain catchment. And the rain catchment, the only thing with that is I want to caution people, it requires a lot of maintenance. You think like, oh, cool, the rain comes and it just goes into a little deal. The rain has dirt in it. It's got dust. Um, that dust, some of it around here is not dust. It's actually manure that, you know, is fine particles that gets in the air, which can cause mold inside of your thing, cause algae to grow. So you're constantly treating it. You have to get that sludge out of the bottom. And I know people out, out here that after three or four years of rain catchment, they said, I'm going back to well water. It's too much of a hassle because you can get sick from it too, if you don't treat your water right. And the animals are always trying to get in there. And so that's the reason why the rain catchment that I do out here will probably be more for garden gardening you know like the hot tub and stuff like that but the drinking water is coming from that well which is it tested out as some of the best water in the entire country and it tastes phenomenal so i'm lucky in that regard i didn't really realize it when the kid when the realtor was telling me like oh yeah like we have a really great community well i'm like oh okay i didn't really know what that meant then i started talking to other people they're like you have one of the best community wells around i'm thinking wow i, I lucked out because i didn't really know that when i first got here so the other well the other community well down the way it's there, but you have to take your own generator and you have to have a 12,000 watt generator to pull that water out of the ground. A 12,000 watt generator is huge, huge and it costs a lot of money and it's heavy and you have to take that with you down there. So, you know, look into that when you're looking into property, if you desire a community well. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, let's see. We've got another one here. This is from uh, Monique 7778. How do you choose where to purchase the property? Uh, and then low taxes, dry land, cheap, cheap property, et cetera. A step-by-step -step process to get water and electricity to the property. Um, do you want to talk about yours first on that? Well, I think uh, the most important factor that I considered about where to buy it is uh, well, cost. If you can only afford to spend $15,000, then don't look somewhere where all the property starts at 50. I mean, that just seems like an obvious answer. And I think the next thing for me is if I can afford the land, it's got a lot of reasonably cheap land, uh, is the weather. I mean, to me, the weather is really the critical factor. I wouldn't choose land in, on the Pacific coast of Oregon or, or Washington because I don't want to be in the rain all winter. Yeah. Uh, nor would I choose year-round property to live in uh, down outside of Quartzsite because it's just too hot. Um, the wind blows a lot in the winter. So weather is a big factor for me. And I think we both had the same thinking here in Northern Arizona, uh, across really the whole strip of Northern Arizona in the high country, you get, you get pretty cold winters and fairly warm summers, mm -hmm. but never an extreme, right? It's never 120 and it's never 20, 30 below. Right. So, you know, that's as good as it gets is not extremes. Not ex well, though the monsoons can get extreme rain. Yeah, but it's so cool. And yeah, it's, <laughs> I love it. It's yeah. what I'm You know, another thing too that I, I love about this area is that since it's a little bit of a drier climate, you don't have to deal with mold. Right, and that's a big. big that's a big issue for yeah. for wetter for like wet environments that can screw up your entire living space. It can make you sick. You can get cancer from it if you don't know it's there. You get black mold. Out here, it rains. It dries up like that. Yeah, it does. you know, and so. I've noticed that with like any sort of structure that I'm building. And also too, I had a little bit of a leak in my camper when I first got out here and it rained a bunch and I thought, dang it, I'm going to have to pull all my siding off in there and get all the, all the insulation out and redo it all. And so I was like, well, I'll do it in the morning. Well, I got up in the morning and pulled it all back and it dried overnight. So I thought, well, that's kind of nice. And so that's, that's a good thing. Um, a lot of people that I know that live in Colorado in wetter areas are saying we're always battling mold. So it's just something to think about. So. I just sent you three more to the left. Okay. So other factors I'd consider when thinking about where is the elevation. Uh, you can you we're we're right around six thousand feet. Mm -hmm. Can you live at six thousand feet if you have breathing problems? Maybe you can't. So you have to be at a lower elevation. That's one of the reasons why our climate is so mellow here mm -hmm. in northern Arizona is because six thousand feet is is a good mellow temperature. Uh, but if you can't handle living at 6,000 feet, then don't even consider that. Um, the other thing, too, is allergies, well, the juniper pollen. Yes. The juniper trees, I mean, you can watch the, the like the wind will hit, and all of a sudden there's like this cloud behind it. Like, what's that? And at first I was like, I don't know what that is. And I realized, I'm like, that's juniper pollen. And so if you have allergies like that, that's another thing to consider. You know, you're out here in the forest. And so you're surrounded by so much plant life. It's a different living experience than being in like the city. So that's something well, you about. did something brilliant when you bought this land. You went and asked the owner, can I camp on that land? Yep. 
And so tell us about that. Yeah. So that, that, that was one thing I wanted to make sure, like I came out here during the daytime. I'm like, wow, it's really quiet, you know, but I want to see what it's like at night. I want to see how the noises are from people that might be coming home from work at five. Now in my area, I'm kind of lucky. There's only 12 people out here full time. And so in my section of the uh, neighborhood, I hear one person that comes in the, up in the morning or, or drives down in the morning from the hill above, and then they, they go back up to work at night. So having one car a day go by twice is no big deal. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can live with that. If I would have been next to a noisy neighbor that you know ran a generator 24-7 and had a dog that barked nonstop, like I'd want to know that before I, I bought that property. So you, know, you don't want to come out and look at it and go, I love it, I'll buy it. Say, hey, can I camp here for a day or two? I want to kind of see how the property lives. I want to see what the noises are of the neighborhood. I just kind of want to get a feel for the land. And they'll let you. Every person that I that I spoke to that was selling land out here that I was interested in, they'll, yeah, go out there and just tell me when you leave so I know that you're not there anymore so we're all good. And that gives you a good sense of the land. So I'd really recommend doing that. Right. Yeah. So let's see. we got some more questions here. Let's see. So, so from Laura1221, uh, this is for, for me. Is your solar solar setup pretty much the same as what you had in your truck, or do you find you need more power settling in, in one place? Definitely find that I need more power because I'm running bigger systems. You know, for example, just my fridge. I I had the little small Dometic uh, 37, uh, I think it's 37 quarter, 37 liter size. Now it's a 45. I call it CFX 45. But prior to that it was a little 37. Now I've got the 65 in there. Well, that that's twice as much power. You know, I'm running Starlink now, which is continuously it's about 30 to 40 watts depending on what's going on it's the winter time and the heater's on that to melt the snow it's 100 watts and that's on all the time you know so and you, you know take that over a 24-hour period and you can start to stack up you see how much more power you need and then i also run an air conditioner you know and then i've got an e-bike that i charge up and just other things that are just just more systems that you have and in that tiny little tacoma you know I, I just had the fridge and that was it and then I eventually added a zero breeze, but that only pulls like anywhere from 100 to 300 watts. And so, yeah, definitely a more robust system. And with the monsoons, you need to have a bank. You can't just say like, okay, I've got enough to get me through the day in the evening. You need to have stuff that can go into day two, day three if needed. So I'm talking like I went from a thousand. Well, let's see. I went from 1.5 kilowatts to got to 10 kilowatts out here now as far as storage is concerned. Batteries. Yeah. So that way I, I know if it rains for a couple of days, I'm still good. I can still operate. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the big things is you can only have so much on a vehicle. And if you're living on a Tacoma, you have a pretty small roof. Yeah. I have 100 watts on the roof and then a panel on the side that I put right. out and I got to camp. Yeah. Or even if you're in a fairly big rig, like a van. Well, I've known guys who got like 600, 700 watts on a van, but that's kind of the upper limit. Mm -hmm. But when you have property, you're going to burn more in the many ways that Brian just said. But you got a big chunk of land. I got tw I've got 20 acres and I got a lot of land. And mm -hmm. So what just exactly what Brian has done, he lays out, he goes, you can buy panels so cheap now. Yeah. Yeah. So cheap. Way cheaper than they were a lot, just even three years ago. Yeah. So. Uh, Santan Solar in Gilbert, Arizona, Phoenix area. They they'll sell starter kits. They, awesome. It's uh, really cheap. They've yeah. got, uh, they'll buy, they'll pull by uh, used panels. They'll test them. They won't sell, sell them to you until they know they work. For a while, I don't know if they still have them. They had, they, have you checked recently? They have a 250 watt panel for 50 bucks. Yeah, that's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Now it's used. Maybe it's been used five, 10 years. So it's still got 20 years left. Yeah. So, so there are 50 bucks times four for 200 bucks. You've got a thousand watts of solar. You can lay it out on your ground. You've got plenty of room. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I would say you're going to probably going to end up getting a lot more, more solar and having a lot more comfort mm -hmm. in a homestead than you will ever will have on the road. And another thing too, which I'm going to be adding is a wind generator because, yes. you know, we have, we have so much wind out here. It's always going except yeah. for, except for between like the 7 PM and 9 PM window, it seems to really die down during that time. And then it picks back up again. But you know, those are like 400 Watts that you can get. You could easily have that running all day long. And you, you know, you take that throughout the whole day, you're creating a lot of power. One and of that's big, just easy. And one of the big things about wind is I'm thinking the exact same thing myself. I've got to like you, we're, I'm more about, we're less than hundred miles apart. Yeah. Uh, I got a steady wind much of the time. However, with, with solar, I mean, with wind, a lot of people aren't aware your best wind, minimum best wind. I mean, this is really what you need to do to make it profitable and pay off. You need to be 30 feet above all the nearby obstructions. 
So that means if you've got a 30 foot tree, you need to be 30 feet above that. You really ideally need 60 feet. Well, we're not going to do that in our vans and cars and Tacomas. Right. Right? You're not carrying around 60 feet of pipe. You're not going to keep it solid on the ground. But you can practically do that when you have your own land. You can bury it in concrete, no problem. You can run guy lines, no problem. And you can have a 60 foot pipe and get your air way up there, your wind gin way up there. And really, my my opinion, the ones that most people are running on their vehicles, RVs, are pretty limited in productivity. But yeah. you get up in the air enough and you'll get good power. So mm -hmm. that's another consideration for being on property mm -hmm. is... Uh, yeah, the, the wind generator capacity. And you know what I thought of too is that that lower meadow where we're going through where I've got the water that comes through. Mm -hmm. Well, for five months out of the year, I could also put a generator down there and have a turbine going. Yeah. You right. know, and that's and that's just going all the time and just constantly kicking out some power. Hydro, you mean? Hydro, yeah. Hydro, yeah. yeah. That would be a great thing. Yeah. So you're kind of working it so you're creating your own one path and that's going to create even more power. Yeah, because where that drops off, when I was showing you where I was mm -hmm. going to build that huge rock check dam, mm -hmm. Where it drops off there, it'd be easy to put a little turbine in there for the, you know, right. for the water or, or for power. You know, it seems it seems almost like science fiction, but hydro is really very practical on a on a homestead. And, and, and you know, if that water's flowing twenty four seven, it's just constant power. All power, yeah. all time. I was watching this video off the forty two. It's I'm sure I've got it saved in my my history, but it was a guy who who has a homestead. I think he was somewhere on the East Coast, but he has a river coming through that. He does everything on hydro. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. If you got moving water, you're way ahead. Yeah. Well, so, just the survival issues. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're way ahead. <laughs> Let alone the power you can create yeah. from it. So, okay. Another great question here from Sint. Sint do we have to go? Well, a lot of Bob's audience wants to know what he plans to do on his property. Oh, okay. Yeah. What do you plan to do on your property? Uh, like I said earlier, I'm going to, I don't, I don't ever plan to live on it. Um, but I know a lot of you, are, I think most of us, even the, the most uh, dedicated nomad, and I, that's how I would describe myself, I am a dedicated nomad. Uh, I've been living on wheels for over, uh, over 22 years, and I'm going to continue living on wheels. Uh, but there's just something in us that wants us to have a, a home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I do like the thought, when I'm on the property, I think, well, I'm kind of making a mess here. I'm kind of <laughs> starting to look a little messy. I wonder, well, will the ranger come by and say something? I thought, oh, I'm the ranger. <laughs> no ranger's coming by to say something about the little mess I'm leaving here. Yeah. And that's that's nice. My, my intention for the property is I, I really like what Brian's doing. I definitely want to maybe get a little RV and just drop on it and leave there. And I love this overhang you built. Oh, it's, it, it's made my living experience out here just... I mean, exponentially better. Oh uh, yeah, it's cooler, mm -hmm. and in the winter, uh, well, it breaks. You could even put out some sides and break wind. Yep. So I yeah, thought, I thought I, about I, that. I love it. I thought, how cool would it be if I take canvas and cut it right. to where I can like make walls that come down the other side, and then I could have a little wood stove in here and have like an outdoor space Absolutely. where I can come hang out. You know, yeah. and it could be like a canvas enclosed area, but not really a tent, more of a just a shade. So yeah, yeah I, I love it. It's and what's fun too is you get out here and like you were saying you. It's your land. You can do what you want with it. And you, I, I had the same thing when I got out here. I thought I need to hide out my land because what if a ranger comes by? I'm like, wait a minute, it's my land. Yeah. yeah but I was like, I was gonna, I'm, I'm, can't, I'm not camping more than two weeks. Well, I live here. I own it. You know, that is that mindset. Yeah. But, and what's nice too is, you know, when I, when I was on the road, I got, when I got really sick, all I wanted to do was like go somewhere for an afternoon and sit on a couch in the air conditioning and just lay down. And I couldn't do that because I. You know, I was in a little coma. I was constantly on the go, and I just really I missed that. You know, and 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 I and I'm not saying anything bad about my nomad life. I loved it. You know, I I, I loved the places that I got to see. I feel like I got to see so many corners of the world that I didn't even know existed that are awesome. And it, what's great is you can get to go back there and stuff. But after a while, I just longed for having just my own place. And it's, there's something about it. I don't know if it's just mentally you feel more secure or what, but it does give you. Like once I got my places, I'm like, I'm like, cool, I'll go back on the road again. Whereas I used to look at it towards the end of my nomad experience when I didn't have land, I, I looked at it as a chore. I began to look at it as like, ah, oh, man, I wish I could just find a place, you know? And so that's when I knew it was time to, to get out there. Plus two of my health had suffered so much and Sierra's cancer, we needed to get off the road. But it's been, um, it's just been great. I mean, I, I love it here. I can't explain how much I love it, really. It's just, you saw me yesterday talking about all the stuff in my area, how excited I get. I'm just yeah. like, I feel like I've, I've won the lottery. 
Well, another thing, another idea that Brian and I both share is uh, concern for the future. Uh, now, I'm not a, a, a crazy nut uh, survivalist or prepper, but I'm a bit of a prepper and survivalist. And I do believe, and I've talked about it on the channel off and on over the years, I do believe it completely in climate change. I'm completely tuned in to, it's my main hobby is being aware of the environmental damage that we're doing to this planet, uh, to the to our the ecosystem that supports us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we, there are bad times ahead based on ecology, on the on the atmosphere. And I do want to be prepared. And part of that is having a piece of land where you can grow some food, mm -hmm. where you can store some food, where you can put away some supplies, where I can have. Um, I, it's my intention to have a minimum of 5,000 gallons of water storage on my property yep. and uh, on some kind of underground st uh, storage safety for, for survival food. So that is kind of a part of me too. Uh, not, I'm not a doomsday prepper. Let's say that. That's not me, me in the least. Me either. <laughs> I think more of myself more as a community prepper. What can I do to help people? And having a piece of land mm -hmm. with some preparations on it I can bring in my friends and my loved ones and we can all be safe. Absolutely. That's what I want to do too. And, you know, I don't have kids. So I don't have a wife or anything. And so I've, I've told my brothers, I was like, Hey, I'm building this out for your kids and to have a place where they can go. And I want to put this into a land trust so that they can't sell it. And that way, you know, it will always be available for them as a place to come and unplug and just relax. And there'll be food production here and all that stuff. And, you know, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a doomsday scenario either a person either, but the last couple of years have been unsettling. And very it's very it, it it's comforting to know that I've got this place out here where I mean, there's no prying eyes, no one comes around, I've got good soil, I can grow food. I've started to do that so far, I'm getting started, and I've got that foundation going to where I'm gonna just continue cultivating that. And then if things do really go off the rails, then at least I can fall back on this and know, okay, I can hunker down here. And I've got a bunch of areas set up for friends to come camp and they do often. I have people that roll through here all the time now. It's like, yeah, just come hang out on my property. And I want to make this a place for where we can just kind of hang out and, you know, put some distance between us and those troubles. Because if anything I've learned over the last two years, I don't think it's going to stop. I think it's just going to get worse, unfortunately. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you look at the resources. I mean, look at the fight for water just from the Colorado River among the states in the southwest. That's not going to settle down. You know, with more people moving into the areas and more water consumption. And I also feel, too, that, you know, we, we do waste a lot of water. I mean, the, why are there golf courses all over the place in the southwest it's when, it, when it's a desert? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Why are we growing cotton in the desert? Yeah, or, or alfalfa. I mean, that's a very, very thirsty crop. Like, what are we doing? And so I think, um, you know, I get a lot of comments on my channel, too, like, you know, oh, you shouldn't cut down your, your juniper trees or anything. But I'm, I, have a, I have a master plan in mind. And the plan is to recharge the groundwater here so that I kind of have my own oasis. And by, by removing some of those juniper trees, especially the scrub juniper that make the soil acidic and aren't that great for the environment, I'm surrounded by 1.9 million acres of national forest. So if I cut down a few trees on my property, I'm not going to kill the environment. I'm actually going to improve it. And I want to diversify the ecosystem on here. And so I'm going to use all those permaculture practices and, and really make a go of it out here. And I know it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be, you know, five, 10 year project, but, I'm not going anywhere and I'm not going to ever sell this land because I love it. And um, I'm just really excited for, you know, what, what's, what's coming up down the pike for, for myself to prepare myself for whatever is out there. Cause I, I just don't want to be in the situation where I feel like I'm a victim, you know? So, right. Um, yeah, another thing too, a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, what I paid for my land. So I got 14 acres out here for 20,500. So that's pretty good deal. You know, if you, you consider that with the, you know, so my, 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 my fees for accessing the well, it's about 500 bucks a year and same with the roads. That's great. My property taxes are less than 200 bucks a year. That's another reason why I like it out here. You know, I, I could have bought in Colorado, but it would have been a lot more finances involved. And I thought, you know, I can drive to Colorado. I don't need to live there. Right. And, and, and I like out here, there, there's not really all that, that many people around, but the towns that I go to resupply, you know, Prescott, Sedona, Flagstaff, they're real towns that have every store that you need. Whereas when I was in Colorado, some of the areas in central and western Colorado, those towns, you can't get supplies and you're ordering stuff off the internet or you're driving two hours, you know, to get to a town that maybe has a store that you need supplies in. 
so uh, the dynamics out here worked, you know, and, and a lot of people think that it's funny when I said I was coming to Arizona people are like, why are you going to Phoenix? I'm mm-hmm. like, That's you, all should, you should come up here and look around a little bit. Yeah. This, this is not the desert, this you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right, we got a few more questions here and then we're going to dive into some of the live chat stuff. Uh, we've got one from John uh, Moteful. It says, I want to buy some land in Northern Arizona where I can live in an RV permanently not for six months or a year while I build a house. Cause a lot of uh, well, what he means by that, a lot of the permits allow you a certain amount of time to live in your RV before your house is actually up and running. So, but I'm finding this uh, uh, difficult due to zoning permitting and having to build a structure with septic. What am I doing wrong or where do I need to look? Any thoughts or help would be greatly appreciated. You know, the, the, the main thing you need to get going is septic. And if you use that 55 gallon barrel, approved state approved septic uh, that you can install yourself that is very very affordable um we have a link to i I think we're going to go ahead and put that at least i'll put it on my community page after this and i think bob's going to go ahead and put it in his uh live chat uh there are some resources that you could that the state provides online with pdf documents you can download if you follow that you can get your your permits approved for an approved septic and you can go ahead and live in an rv on your property um, another thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to plumb any water into your RV until you have that septic done. Because if you plumb water in, then that's considered, they, they, they think of it as a, um, a, a permanent unit and not a mobile one. So you can do that after you get your septic in, but just do that 55 gallon barrel one first. It's not going to cost you the enormous five to 10 to $20,000 that a normal septic would, and you can get going. And then later on, if you want to put in the legit septic, you can. Well, I thought we'd, uh, I'm not an expert on the, all the counties in Arizona, but I'm pretty familiar. I've been uh, studying them for a while now. So I thought we'd look at some of the common counties in Arizona. Uh, in the Southeast, which is still something you should get, that's Tombstone. If you know Arizona at all, Southeast Arizona is on the, down on the border of uh, Mexico and New, and New Mexico. Uh, Tombstone is where you, the city you think of down there. It's about 3,000 feet. So it's quite a bit cooler than, say, uh, Phoenix. And uh, and I believe it's still true. I know it was true for a long time. If you buy larger than five acres, you can sign a document. It's right on the county website. I've gone and looked at it. You sign this document and you agree that you do not have to uh, maintain county permits, a county uh, zoning. Uh, and and then you, you say in this document that you're not going to hold them responsible. And so you can opt out of, of uh, zoning. In uh, in Apache Apache County, I'm assuming that's still true. You need to go make double the research, but within the last few years, I've looked and that's still true. That was then. It's true then. You do your own research. Uh, you're responsible for your decisions, not me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that so that's uh, Cochise County. I said the wrong thing, didn't I? That's Cochise County, and then I uh, do I think due north of it is Apache County. Does that sound right? I think it's directly above it. Apache County is on far north, uh, far west and north Arizona. And that is, uh, I guess, the most comp, fa- uh, famous town there is uh, St. John's. You'd have to stretch your, your imagination to call it a town. It's not much of a town, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but it's, it's kind of the center. Few, it's got a few stop signs. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the center of that of the, of Apache County. Uh, and the bottom line is there, uh, and again, I'm not, don't do anything because I'm saying this. I'm not, I'm nobody, no expert. They essentially have no regulations. That's just the bottom line. There are no, let me change that. There probably are regulations, but um, there are no enforced regulations. I know people who are, who've been there for decades and have never seen any kind of zoning and they just do anything they want. Yeah. That's out here too. That's I, I know, true. I, I know most people out here are like that. Are exactly like yeah. that. Now that doesn't mean he can't come in uh, next year and say, here are all the rules, you're violating them, fix it all now, you know, that can happen. We're, don't go by anything I'm telling you. Yeah. You're inheriting all your risk of all your decisions. But the bottom line is the county has no one in it, and they want people in it, mm-hmm. and so they're going to make it easy for you to come to. Yeah, and, and, in my, and in my area, and most of the counties are like this, they can't just come on your land and be like, well, let's see what you got going on around here, you know, like, they, they just, they, there either has to be a complaint from uh, a resident around or you had to get in trouble with the law for something to where they'd have to come out. And then they're allowed to look at your land. But prior to that, they can't just come on your property. And so there, no one comes around anyway. I've never seen a code 
code person. I've never seen a cop out here. No. Like I've never seen it. I don't see anybody out here, to be honest. So, <laughs> so That's no, a good way to live. Yeah, but... just no one's coming around. And, and but but I mean I you know and I know somebody from the county too that worked at the county office. I was like, hey, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. Are they like? I'll let check on. He goes, dude, we can't even get the people in town. And he goes, you're so far away from us. We'll never get much where you're at. I was like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. You know, and so it, it, they, they work with you is what, is what I'm saying. You know, I, I would think that if you're in a county that's super heavily populated, they're going to regulate you because they they need to. Well, if you're near the population center. Right. Yeah. But, but being out here in the country, I mean, you know, you, I got four or 40 acre parcels to the north of me before my next neighbor over the ridge. And I never, I never hear them. I never see them, anything. My next neighbor is a quarter of a mile down the road over there. And there's no one around. So it's like, I could, I don't even think I can make enough racket out here to cause a complaint, <laughs> you yeah. know? So it's, yeah. you know, the, a lot of the parcels are 40 acres to wrap your head around that about three acres as a county block or as a city block, you know, it's, uh, as far as size is concerned. And so you think about that and you think about all the biomass between me and my neighbor, all of that is noise deafening, you know? And so like all these trees, they, he's never going to hear if I run a generator. And I asked, I actually asked him when I got one, I was like, Hey, I don't want to be that neighbor that makes all this noise and is a, and is a like a blight on the community. You know, I got my generator running right now. Go on your front porch. He's like, I don't hear one thing. I'm like, okay, cool. And it was like a clear day and, and no wind. So, you know, it, those 40 acre parcels lend themselves to privacy. And then also too, you can get back in there in some of those areas where it's heavily wooded and no one can see what you're doing. And so that's, that's nice. You know, I'm not out here breaking the law. I'm not trying not to do anything that's, that's against, against the codes or anything. But it's nice to just know that, like, you know, I mean, if it's just not you, you, you're not under their thumb is what I'm trying to say. So let's continue our tour around Arizona and counties. So let's talk about Coconino County. Of course, that's Flagstaff uh, and Flagstaff is full court enforcement. You, If you're anywhere near them, you can expect to hear from zoning. But I know a lot of people uh, north of Flags, north west of Flagstaff is the junction, the Grand Canyon Junction. And I know a lot of people there who never ever, uh, no matter, there's zero enforcement. I can I can just tell you that. I've known people that have lived there for decades in their RVs and there's no enforcement. Yeah. Again, will they start next year? Maybe, I don't know. But as of today, for the last decades, there has been no enforcement at all in Coconino County, away from the population centers. Mm -hmm. Next over from there is Yavapai County. I know some people in Yavapai County. Same thing. There's no enforcement. Uh, they, they, if you get far enough off grid, they don't have the time to come after you. Yeah. You're not. You're not going to make any money on you. They're just going to make an enemy. That's the biggest one. Is they want to make money with the fines. Yeah. And if you've got minor, minor infractions, they're like, it's not even worth it. It's not even worth the gas to drive out there. No. And so again. Um, I'm not all that familiar with the with the county regs in Yavapai. I think they're reasonable, but there won't be any enforcement if you're remote enough. Yeah, I can tell you people here that I know on our property owners association board are like, we don't have anything permitted. We've been at it for three decades. Yeah. And they're like, we've never had one person stop by. We've never had anybody give us a hassle about anything. Again, so. but we're not giving you any kind of legal advice. And then let's talk about Mojave County, which is the uh, county next over from you I believe it's next over from Yavapai. Yeah, it and it's up against the California border. And it's mostly desert. There's some high country in there, but it's mostly desert. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know a little bit about that because I know someone who lives in uh, Mojave County. And they're doing something now, like Kingman is an example. Uh, around Kingman, there is a ton, a ton of land for sale that's really cheap. And if you're an RV, this is an RV. If you're just, you go out and buy a really cheap old trailer, that's an RV. Mm -hmm. You can buy, do, do, Linda, do you remember how much that permit was? Do you remember that conversation we had way back? 25 bucks? I think it was. I believe it was 25 bucks. You can get a permit for your RV. And uh, because you're self-contained, the idea is you're going to haul your waste out and you're going to haul your water in. And so uh, in this area around Yavapai, that I have, not Yavapai, on Mojave, that I happen to know real well. You'll see people every day driving in and out with their IBP, IBC, IBC <laughs> totes, totes, <laughs> getting their water. Uh, I'm old folks, you gotta accept that. Uh, and they pay their $25 a year and they've got a permit for the RV and they're set and legal. Mm -hmm. That's the amazing thing. They don't have to worry about their breaking rules. They're just not being enforced. They're set and legal. 
it's hotter country. If you know Kingman, that's down maybe 3,000 feet. It's much hotter. Have you seen the creeks, though, that are on the uh, east side of Mojave County that are coming up the hill? There's creeks that flow all the way down to like Baghdad and those places that are that start up north of 40. And I started driving them, and there's there's property for sale out there where you're close to live water. It's pretty, so, it's pretty amazing. And yeah. it's all spring fed. And that's the weird thing about Arizona. You can have desert, nothing's growing, and then right next to it, not very many miles away, you can have high country with trees and yep. water flowing. And there and there are some exceptional high country parcels on the on the west side of Mojave County. So if you get out, I, I recommend people get out and drive around because the, the pictures you're going to see online that the realtors put up are not good. And it doesn't give you a sense of the land. There's usually like only a handful of photos. And for a 40 acre parcel, you know, you could go through 200 photos and still not get a feel for it. So get out and drive the areas. I also recommend too, so the, there's mountain ranges all throughout Northern Arizona and they run North South, generally speaking. So, you know, on the sides of those ridges is where you can buy really choice parcels that have really good diversity of plant life, also a variety of terrain, a variety of natural resources, different sort of rocks that you can use to, uh, come here, see, over here, come on, come here, come, here, come over here. We got, we got Cody in here, come over here, come here, come here, sit right here, come here, come here, come here. We got, we want to get the dogs in real quick. So we got Sierra in the house and then we got, we got Cody here. We got, the, we got, we got, we got the uh, masters here joining us. <laughs> I always joke with people that Sierra is the star of my channel and I'm just here to make her comfortable. But, uh, but back to, um, you know, to Mojave County, there, there's some cool stuff out there. So drive around anywhere out here, really, in the in, in the in northern uh, Arizona. Drive around, look for those parcels that are on the sides of those if you want, like, you know, good sunset views and all that stuff. And it's just a different, like in my area specifically, the low-lying areas just don't have as much variety of, of plant life. And so that's why I chose up here on the sides of the hill. And, my, and I face the west, so I got killer sunsets every night. That is really the key. You live on wheels. Drive all over Arizona until you find something that appeals to you. Yep. So, uh, and I can tell you, there's something for everybody out here. Yeah. There, there is exceptional terrain. Yeah. I've been driving around my area. I am Florida. What's out here? You know, there's springs all over the place and all that stuff. You just got to, you got to get out and find it. And, and the thing is, too, is a lot of it looks like it's private, but it's not. It's just game and fish gates that you have to go through for like, you know, keeping cattle in a certain place and then elk in other places and stuff like that. It's just, it's just, it's just a resource management as all, as all it is. So you can go to those gates and if that little game and fish thing on it, you can go through it. You just have to close it. So just keep that in mind. Two resources to know what's public and private that I th I would highly recommend. One is U.S. public lands, which um, will tell you National Forest BLM. They'll, they'll give you basic ideas of all the government ownership of land. And another one is On X Off-Road. That's a good one. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Uh, on X, there's a couple of On X. Super, super apps. The On X hunt will actually give you the name of the person that owns the land but it's like a hundred bucks and and gaia will too they, they, oh, they, have, will. they have an overlay for private and, which well, will give you that too it was i think that 20 30 bucks yeah for the year i think yeah. is what it was and it was pretty affordable and then they also have one of their maps the more detailed map has where the springs are located there you go so you that find the springs yeah that's i that's key and i, I didn't realize it until i downloaded the app i'm like look and i'm like wow there's only springs in my areas then i'm going for one of these spots and then there's like great camping and you're next to water and all that stuff. And in Northern Arizona and Arizona in general, that's kind of, that's, that's highly sought after. And I'm going to spots where it's like, no one's here. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. So, so you can use those resources. To help right. Uh, U.S. public lands, but it's cheap, three to bucks, but Gaia and uh, the Onyx, either uh, off-road or hunt, good resources, well worth the, the investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good one here. Michael owns the same one. When people mention Arizona, desert is typically what only comes to mind is like very little real desert anywhere near there. And I'm like, that's true. Cause like in this yeah. area, I probably have to drive about, gosh, I would think at least two hours to get to desert. Kingman. Yeah. You know, so that's about an hour and 15, I guess. So yeah, but that's, you know, 70 miles, 80 miles an hour on the freeway to get out there. So it's, it's a ways from here. So it's cool because the Colorado Plateau, for those who aren't aware with the way the terrain lays out, that goes all the way down here into northern Arizona, pretty far. And then, of course, you've also got the Mogollon Rim that comes in from from the uh, eastern boundary with New Mexico, and that goes on for 200 miles. That Mogollon Rim is insane. It is gorgeous. And you get up in the White Mountains here, and you're like, you're in Arizona. I mean, it's massive Ponderosa pines. Yeah, it's bigger. Right? You can't even put your arms around. They're huge, huge. You know. And then you got lakes up there, and 
lots of creeks, uh, really good places to fly fish. The, the, uh, Arizona has Gila trout, and so does New Mexico. That's the, that's one of the rarest trouts out there. It's on the endangered species list, and you get an opportunity to catch them up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Apache Reservation, Fort Apache, has tons of great places to go. And so, you know, it's like I, I really feel like this is a very good spot for those that enjoy the outdoors but don't want the deep lock in winter like you would get in Idaho, you know, to where you're, you're, you're literally frozen in for six months out of the year. You know, it just makes it a little bit easier to work with in the wintertime because they're not as extreme, but you still get a great winter season. You, you get all four seasons. You're not, like, locked into just one type of, you know, weather condition. So I like it. I call it interactive living, you know, because we're out here. We're, 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 we got, we're creating our own power. We've got our own water. You know, you're kind of creating your own, your own living space out here, but you're doing it always with active out there doing stuff. It's like it's a great lifestyle to keep you young, I think. Well, we don't have much time left. What's, uh, okay. what's a really good question? What's the best question that we can spend People our time are really on? Wondering, well, what area Ryan's in? Um, what? Let me let me look at ones I just sent. How much do they really realistically need to get a habitable homestead of say like five acres in northern Arizona? Um, like if you need per well building permits, well septic, like how much are people? And maybe talk about how to save that money. Or well, I, I if if you want to go the whole route, if you want to get permits, you want to put in septic, you want to put in a well, you're talking hundreds of thousand dollars. So especially the well. That's, that's not what we're one. that's not what either of us are talking about. You're talking about something completely different. I'm talking about uh buying a pretty cheap piece of land and living. Because <laughs> uh, that's all I know, and that's all I do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I can't give you the, the the whole round. I don't even know. Yeah, to more than I have is all I do know. So I would say uh, we know a friend who just bought uh, in Coconino. Uh, he paid fourteen thousand for two acres. Mm -hmm. So I think for uh, that's pretty common. Yeah. In around this particular area of Coconino. Is Apache County, uh, bet someone says, um, is Apache County preferable? Tom C will ask to like being around Williams area. Uh, I, I think it's nice up there. They're pretty lenient with everything too in Apache. Apache seems to be the most lenient county, I think. Um, also, it's also going to be the hottest. Well, not the hottest, but it's going to be much hotter. Yeah. Uh, it's well, desert. Because you were saying down by, but you said south of Williams? Um, Are they asking the area south of Williams? He's asking about Apache County. Um, like Bob, you're kind of familiar with different county permits, how they, uh, how hard it might be. To what, are, what are the two we're comparing? He's yeah. asking about Apache versus Coconino. Well, it depends. If he's talking about north south of Williams, he may be into Yavapai. Oh, right. He could be in yeah, because like, be yeah, you're looking at it here. This is Apache. So, and then you got Sedona. He's so, asking about Williams in particular, isn't that Coconino? Uh, Williams is Coconino, yeah. It's, okay. right, it, it's right on the edge of Coconino. It's like West Coconino, right close to Yavapai. And Williams is great. Williams is Williams awesome. Is Williams has a bunch of great places back in there to fish. They've got Ponderosa Pine Forest. It's nice and cool. Uh, they got Bill Williams Mountain out there. You can go hang out. You can go north into the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's your close to I 40. So if you need to get on the highway and jam and get to other spots of the state, you can. Um, I like it around Williams. So Williams has nice services in town. They've got, you know, they've got a full Safeway with a big organic section. They've got pharmacies. They've got car repair stores. They've got, you know, Napa Auto Parts, all that stuff. And they have the train that comes through there, which is kind of cool. Amtrak comes through there, so you can hop on that and go tour around the country if you want. I think Williams is a neat little town. The only thing about it is it does feel like the main street is a little bit touristy. Oh, very with like with like the t-shirt shops and stuff like yeah. that. I don't really care for that. I would like it if it get converted to like you know local spots like there are some good restaurants there though especially off the main drag there's some great stuff on the east side of town really good stuff so. well thinking in terms of the county rather than the town i think yavapai is preferable to coconino mm -hmm. because Cocon well yavapai has prescott that's a big town yeah prescott valley yep. chino yep um, and they're so busy down there. Yeah. The, the, I mean, Prescott Valley is growing so fast. They're really fast. They, they are chock full with work down there for months. Yeah. So they're not coming up here. I think if I was given the choice of buying in Coconino County or Yavapai County, just looking at the county itself, 
I think I'd choose Yavapai. Yeah, you know, it's it's a little bit more lenient, and uh, you know, with Coconino having Flagstaff, it's just there's more people around, you know, and and the, and the prices are so much more. If the the closer you get to the city, same with Prescott, the closer you get to town, I mean, they skyrocket. You know, out here, so I bought the land for twenty thousand five hundred. This was six thousand. Okay, my quad was eight thousand. And so I'm all in, you know, and then I bought 10,000 pounds of reclaimed lumber for a thousand bucks. I'm all in for less than 35 green out here. You know, that's really nice to have this parcel of land, 20 acres. And granted, I got it, I got it right as COVID was hitting. So prices have gone up a tad, but it's not bad. You know, you're not looking at like hundreds of thousands of dollars. generally anywhere from 750 to 1500 per acre whereas if you get a smaller parcel especially five acres and under you're looking at more like two to three thousand per acre is that what you're seeing too yeah i think i paid uh, right at three thousand per acre for mine mm -hmm. i bought 40 acres uh and uh yeah if you go and buy two then it's going to be 15 yeah it's like seven thousand acres right yeah and, and there are areas that have that though like there's an area that's way south of here and it's right next it, it butts up to the prescott national forest oh is it oh we're going are you sure i think it did go out oh what? we don't have a screen it did go out darn it all right well we'll continue on bobs uh no because i was off your going off your start oh. right now I'm just starting up my own. Site. I am so sorry. I did not. See How that. can you get turn it on? Yeah, I just turned it back on. Oh, it won't take long. So. Oh, here it's on already. Is it? Oh, I think it is. But our stream is going to disconnect, Bob. We're going to have to start a new one. So. Okay. okay. Darn it. And I can't connect. That was my. That's okay. That was um an hour, almost an hour. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I, it was so much better to yeah to have a, a conclusion. The pause. Yeah. Right. Let me see here. Um. It, <clears throat> Once I get another connection, it will come back on, and I can probably get the stream going right, again. Yours is, yeah, you know, I thought, oh man, I should, I should connect it to my own. There it is. Sterling, let me do this real fast. Okay, now we're back. Are we back? No, well, hang now on. We will be in a minute. There it is. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. So your start, yours is on, back on. Oh, do I have to do something to get back okay. on? Oh, uh, it's me, Bob. I got to deal with it because it's coming. Okay, sorry about that, people. My my live stream, my Starlink uh, went down for a second, but now it's back up. So give us a second here. We're gonna we're gonna get everything back up and running, and we we were getting ready to close. So, but we don't want to we don't we don't want it to end on a technical difficulty. I can't connect to your Starlink. Is it up? Yours is up and running. Yeah, and it's just it's just Starlink. Um, there's no password or anything. Yeah, it's um not. I can't connect. So I'm gonna okay well you'll be slow okay, sit tight bob i'll um i'll try and get streaming back in up and down. technical difficulties okay. okay cool i think that's going so i can't get on here you can't uh why is that's it not okay. why is it not letting you on that's all right i'm still working Back up, but um, okay, there we are. It looks like I'm back up. Looks like Bob's is okay. Hold on, it Bob's is back up. Okay, cool. And we've and uh, mine just refreshed where there's 79 because we had those people in there. Now it's back. Sorry, everybody, for that. Uh, that was my error. My Starlink went down for a second, but it's back. Are we do we have Bob's up and running? Uh, I'm still working on it. Okay. Well, you didn't do anything, you couldn't probably couldn't have prevented it. Yeah, that's true. I just know what happened yeah with i'm back Somebody up i'm out. apologizing and i'll put a banner okay cool so all right we're live. back up i'm live too um yeah let me um yes you are live too we didn't even lose that many people okay awesome we're back okay. sorry about that that, back. that was yeah, my I'm starlink issue people saying. okay cool <laughs> And uh, you know what we didn't tell? I don't know that we've done yet. What's that? As how people can come and find and know you. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so I, my channel, right. you know, That's off, what I off Grid Backcountry Adventures. But also, too, I have a website. It's offgridbackcountryadventures.com. And I have a contact page on there. That goes to my email. And I try to, I, on every Friday, I try to go to those emails and answer everybody. So if people have questions, hit me up. I, I, I want to be a resource to help people, right. you know, feel comfortable about the decisions they want to make about going off grid because it's a big, you, you can make mistakes, you know, and you don't want to be in the wrong area and you don't want to 
You just don't want to get into a land deal that you don't want. You know, I know someone who bought uh, just to tell you a story of mistakes you could make back. They bought it in Mojave County. This was probably 10 years ago. They bought two acres. They put $500 down. They were paying $200 a month. So they buy it. They're going to come and live on their van on it. She lives on the property for a month. And a guy from the county pulls up and says, do you have a permit? She says, no. She says, he says, you can't be here. And she couldn't sell. I mean, he literally said, you have to leave. You cannot live on this land in your van. And so uh, she walked away. She walked away from the money she put down and got nothing. So we don't want that to happen to you, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, again, like I said, recent, before this, Mojave's really changed. And now it's, uh, I don't know if you can live with a van on it. I believe you do have to have an RV. Uh, but if you have, uh, if, you're self if it's a self-contained unit, you can call it. It's got to be an RV. I mean, that, that, that would just be the worst. Feeling. Oh, the worst possible. You're just like, I believe this is my yeah. place. I, I spent the money. You know? yeah. Gosh, that would just be. She called me in tears and said, oh, this, this guy just came in and I've lost everything. Oh, man. No, you don't want that. No. So, you know, do your research and ask around. Another thing, too, is ask, like, say, hey, can I speak to, if there's a property association, can I speak to those folks and just kind of get a feel for them? Because the, the truth is some some communities don't want more people coming in. You know, because they're like, hey, I don't want things changing. It's perfect out here the way it is. But everything always changes. And so, you know, just see if the people are cool. Everybody out here I talk to in my place is awesome. Um, I, I'm really thankful. I uh, one of one of the main reasons why I bought in this area too is that you know with my friends being down the road, I kind of had a, like an instant like community group. That I'm like, hey, if I need tools, I can go down to my friend's place, grab some tools. Also, um, my friend has a seed bank, which is real nice for any sort of food you want to grow and all those things. And so, you know, I, I think it's important to get a feel for your neighbors as well. Very important. Yeah. Well, that's. Your thought of coming and spend a few days on the property before you buy. That's a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the cheapest one acre, or half acre, or smaller parcel people could get is? Oh, uh, somewhere, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier uh, land.com. Oh, okay. Land. I think land.com because you could put in a price. You could say you could put in a county, you could put in a price, and it will show you everything. And they have a lot of low, really low end stuff. So land.com. And you can sign up for the newsletter. And you'll get it, and I, that's a very useful resource. Don't you think St. John's is maybe the cheapest area? I would think mm -hmm. St. John mm -hmm. is the cheapest, and and they have a ton of those carry. The owner will carry and owner will finance. Very common, tons of them up there. And I think that what it is, they want people up in that area. There, there's some great parcels up there, you know, especially the mountainous stuff and everything. And and they're up high. They're like some of that place is like 62, yeah. 6,300 feet. That's pretty. Is, there's some real pretty country. Yeah, it's real nice. Oh, the one thing you got to understand: the cheaper it is, the more remote it is. Because if you're near a population center, it's going to cost a lot more. <clears throat> so, and we wanted that. We both wanted to be remote, yeah. and so. That's how you're going to get your cheapest land. But are you a person, ask yourself this and be really honest. Do you want to go and live remote and only see one person a, a week? <laughs> yeah. And and do you want to drive an hour and a half to get groceries? Absolutely. You know, not, not a lot of people want to do that. Right. Is that for you? And you better be really honest. Are you going to buy a piece of property and then think, oh, I hate it here. Yeah. You don't want that. We both are thriving on the places we bought because we have, we're honest with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, and I, and I, I like the fact that when I go to town, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get supplies for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And so I'll go and it's a big grocery bill, but I'm like, I'm not going, I'm not returning for almost a month. Yeah. You know? And then once you get your systems dialed in, you don't, you're not making those trips to town. So your gas costs, the costs are going way down to get supplies. Then you get all your infrastructure built out here. You're growing your own food and everything you do can lower your costs. So. Okay, is there one last question that goes we can answer real quick? Um, I think you covered it from my end, but people want to know about the RTR if you want to okay. talk about okay. the dates of the RTR. <laughs> yes, the RTR is happening. It's going to be exactly like it has been the last two years. It will be in Quartzsite at the city park. Uh, if you know the city park, you know where the library is in, our, at, in Quartzsite. It's directly kitty corner across the street from the library. Uh, there's the jets there on the corner, and it's the big... We'll be in the ball field again. Uh, the dates, I just don't remember them off the top of my head. I might could look them up. They're probably on my calendar. Uh, they'll be the middle of January. They always are in the middle of January. Um, Such a nice time down there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a nice good time, time to be there. Yeah. Yeah, the last day will coincide with the first day of the Big Tent, 
we always do that. So you can go down there to the uh, big tent and get a job. Uh, let's see if I have it in here. No, it's not on here. So I don't know when they are. Is it online? So I can pull it up and see. Uh, yeah, we might have announced it on the Howa.com. It's an, actually a production of Howa, Homes on Wheels Alliance. No, Howa.org. Sorry about that. Howa.org, H-O-W-A.org. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, it might be up there already. I don't know. Uh, I'm looking at January of 24. My guess is it's over on the 19th and the, la uh, the last day the RTR will be the 18th. So the first day will be about the 8th. Just guessing. Just looking at the calendar and guessing. Okay. My guess is January 8th through the 18th. Okay. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it's saying here, like, January, yeah, you could go on the 8th, and then by the time the, is this the Big Ten? You end so up the 20, Big Ten. 21st on that, so it looks like, looks like that was two weeks, like, they, like the week of the 8th and the week of the 15th, probably. Right, yes, I think that's going to gonna be about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. It'll be great. Be there. You right on. We're going to go, we're going to have bubbles on our side. Here we got bubbles. Oh, we got bubbles. <laughs> Years ago, I turned on when I just started YouTube. And I, I turned on the bubbles by accident. It's a little cute thing who does. I didn't know that was, that was available. Yeah, I didn't either. And I had no idea how to turn it off once I turned it on. This is going. And so people have just been demanding bubbles ever yeah, since. Awesome. So bubbles. Cool. Bubbles. Okay. I think we're done. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Sorry for the technical difficulties, yeah. but we're yeah. back up and running. So that's part of being off road. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thank you to Bob for coming out here and visiting my place. My it's pleasure. been really nice to hang out and just chat about yeah. stuff. And, yeah. you know, it's it's fun. I, I love having a bunch of nomad friends like we were talking about. Yeah. I've got so many nomad friends and talking to them. We all share that same sense of excitement yeah. for life and just the challenges that any sort of off grid living presents to us we look at it as like learning experiences mm -hmm. and i love that so yeah yep yep right, okay everybody. thanks so much guys all right we'll see you on the next one thanks for tuning in okay end stream end cool all right we're good